It's time to take a ride on the Steelers afternoon drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome into another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. Alan, how are we feeling? I feel so much better about the entire world every time that music hits. This is just this is my happy place. I don't know. It gets me fired up. It gets me going. You know, I brought something back with me from Cleveland. I think I've been dealing with something over the last couple of days. Um, the music definitely does help out a little bit, but I think I might need uh, you to maybe take me up a level as well. Maybe carry the torch a little bit energy wise throughout this episode. Right. So hopefully you're I able think to... I got that. I think I got that. I'm hopefully. ready. It was a, it was a hot, hot day at training camp and it was miserable out there, but I'm in the air conditioning now and the music's playing and I feel a little bit better about my life. So let's go. Let's do it. There we go. Uh, Alan, yesterday we touched on a little bit the Brandon Ayuk situation, and uh, as the what was the a lot of people were throwing out different terms um, for soap operas as the Ayuk turns the bold in the Ayuk, whatever you want to call it, uh, the latest saga in it. We touched on it a little bit yesterday. Uh, the Steelers by name put out there today. Adam Schefter originally on Pat McAfee's show said that they were out, didn't see them as a destination. And then I don't know if backtrack is the right word, right terminology to use, um, but he put out that they re-engaged in talks this afternoon. Um, what is your take on this? Did that ever happen, in your opinion? Was there ever a point where they would be considered out or classified as out of these conversations? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm approaching it from a little bit different perspective. Are there going to be times when the 49ers are going to say, we're not going to consider that offer? Yeah, like, uh, there's not any value to me in engaging in the blow by blow. Here's the deal. The Pittsburgh Steelers want Brandon Ayuk. And until Brandon Ayuk is holding a press conference in a different city, the Steelers are going to be involved in trying to get Brandon Ayuk. There's not going to be any out until it's over. That's not, that's not a thing. Now you can characterize the offers and say, San Francisco does not want what the Steelers are offering. And they do want what say the Cleveland Browns and the, New England Patriots are offering, and I, that was reported last night, and I believe that report to be largely correct. Um, but that doesn't mean they're out or it done. You know, uh, you got to be careful with words that involve finality mm -hmm. here. There is no done yeah. until he's standing there holding a jersey somewhere else. Yeah, that is ex the exact response that I had to somebody on Twitter that asked me about it. Uh, they said, don't the reports uh, from today, from Schefter and stuff, make you feel like the Steelers are out? And I said, in a world where the ask can and will be fluid, I don't think that you can use that word. Uh, they might not be willing to meet the current ask, but categorizing them as out uh, would be untrue. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, there are multiple parts to this. There's the 49ers have to get a deal that they like. They they need a trade that they're comfortable with. Ayuk has to sign a deal with a new team that he's comfortable with and that that team is comfortable with. And the 49ers are going to have to balance the best trade they can make with a team that Ayuk can make a deal with versus just keeping him and either playing hardball or paying him what he wants. All those are still options on the table. 49ers could just look at this whole process and say, everything that you guys are offering us stinks, and we're not going to trade him for nothing. We don't want to lose him, so we'll just slightly overpay him. We recognize his overpayment, but that's the least bad outcome. Like That's, that's a very rational decision. Um, I certainly think there's plenty of middle ground solutions for how you can in San Francisco that gets him through this year where they bump up his salary. They agree to waive the franchise tag and say, let's give it one more shot, try to win a Super Bowl, And then you can walk in free agency and we'll take that third round comp pick. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, there are the draft pick does nothing for the 49ers. They are trying to win a Super Bowl. We, you and I have been talking about that. I feel like since April or March, right. um, and that's why you're seeing a lot of the conversation about the return centered on not the draft picks being offered, but the players being offered in return. Cleveland's offered up Amari Cooper. The Patriots have offered up Kendrick Bourne. And Derek Bell and I reported uh, about an hour ago at SteelersNow.com that the Steelers have had talks involving starting right guard James Daniels. I don't know that that represents a, a an eagerness from the Steelers to move away from Daniels. But I do think it represents Omar opening up the cupboard, being like, 
man, what's in here that anybody else could want? Uh, it's like it's like yeah. when you're uh, it's like when you're at school and you forgot that it was like food drive day, and so you're not prepared, mm-hmm. and so your mom's gonna be like, well, we don't really need these peaches, I guess. Here, take these. Uh, you know, they don't have a lot of surplus. This is a team that is not overwhelmingly talented. They don't have depth in places where they can just afford to trade it away. The offensive line might be the one place. So that makes sense. But I say that saying that I, I don't think that was brand new information when uh, Derek and I put it out there and there's no trade. So clearly uh, just the presence of James Daniels was not am- am- enough to uh, make John Lynch swoon in, in these trade talks. Just the way that things have kind of maybe changed externally, maybe not internally, but just like on the surface, the willingness to trade Brandon Ayuk seemingly within the last 48 hours. Um, Do you feel like because of that, we are any closer to a resolution, whatever that is, or is this just all part of the process and you don't feel like we know one way or another if we're getting closer to that point? I feel like we're just at a different staring match now where, you know, instead of Ayuk and the 49ers staring at each other over like $2 million difference in salary and some guarantees, now they're staring at each other over whether he's going to be traded to Pittsburgh or Cleveland. And, you know, it's just still a different staring match. I don't know how to predict when a staring match is going to end. And I also am very cautious about like, like I wrote on Twitter that I, I don't think the sides are that far apart, and I don't. I don't think the Steelers' offer is that far from the offers that the Browns and Patriots have made that the 49ers reportedly would accept. However, Ayuk and the 49ers have not been far apart since April, and they have made no traction. Sometimes you don't you get to not far apart, and that is just all the closer either side will get. Sometimes you get to staring, and nobody ever blinks, and that's it just ends. And so... Uh, you know, being closer doesn't necessarily mean we're at the end. Okay. All right. I don't know that I have too much else to say on it other than what's already been said, said over the last two episodes. So if you have anything else that you feel like needs added at this juncture. I will just say the longer this goes on, the better I feel about the Steelers' chances Gen- in general. And I, and I think at no point I, I continue to feel more – I mean, look, I – I think I continue to feel more optimistic about the Steelers' chances as time moves on. I think the longer this plays out, the the better the chances are that that because they have that sort of whole card in that Ike wants to come to Pittsburgh, and I believe Mm -hmm. they are largely willing to meet his demands financially. And so, like that's that's a strong. I I think that's a good hand. I don't think they're winning. Um, but I think they're, if you're a poker player, I think they're drawing pretty nicely here. You know, uh, and that's not a bad place to be in that same breath on the opposite end of the spectrum. Would that make you feel worse about the Browns and Patriots chances? It's been put out there that at least maybe his mind could change if they were offering more money on the contract or whatever that is. Maybe it's just the situation. So he wouldn't change that part of his mind. But does that make you feel worse if you were one of those two teams trying to land him the longer it goes on? Yeah, I mean, when it's reported that the 49ers have accepted your offer and then 20 hours go by and nothing happens, like what, I mean, what, it doesn't, you know, I mean, it's not like Brandon Ayuk's contract demands have been a secret, right? You know, like they, they got to, they got to make a deal with him. Now, uh, it could be that he is just trying to leverage the situation and not engaging with them in serious discussions. I I don't really know. You know, Brandon Ayuk can make this drag out a long time if he wants to. I'm not sure why that would be his desire, but he certainly can make this take forever if if that's what he wants to do. Yeah, I don't know. I I mean, I don't get me wrong. It's it's something that uh, definitely needs talked about. I'm excited when we do get to the conclusion of this, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, Alan, a, t- a practice did take place today as well, so I guess we can move on to that portion of things. Uh, we'll start with Russell Wilson, who went first in seven shots today. Yeah, uh, Russell Wilson first, and I thought Russell looked pretty good. I mean, he was out there. It was first pass was a touchdown to George Pickens. I don't think he threw an incompletion in any of the passes that I saw him throw. Now, it was a very run-heavy day, so there wasn't a ton of reps, and him and Justin Fields split the first-team reps with Cal Allen still taking all the second and most of the third-team reps. So it was a pretty 
light work day for Russell Wilson, but I believe he's going to walk out of here with a perfect passer rating for the second day in a row. We'll see how long that continues. Um, but I think he was, he looks good. He, he looks like the player I saw all spring. He doesn't look in any way hampered by the calf. We saw him move in the pocket. Um, you know, I, I think Russ looks pretty solid and I think he's probably going to continue to the more work that he gets. Um, probably not enough work to get to get a whole lot more conclusions out of it than that i mean i think it was maybe 10 passes something like that gotcha okay um okay let's, let's shift to the offensive line then because i saw you put out there i saw you know friend of the show nick farabaugh put out there roger jones at left tackle troy Fatano at right tackle saw quite a bit of it Saw a whole lot of it. The whole first and second team offensive line were all mixed up today. Uh, vet day off for Isaac Samalu. The Steelers rotated Broderick Jones and Troy Fautano at right tackle. They rotated Broderick Jones and Dan Moore at left tackle. They rotated Spencer Anderson and Mason McCormick in with the first team in place of Samalu. And then also there were some reps where they gave James Daniels some time off and both of the young guys were in there. So there really wasn't a second team offensive line today. It was just the ones and twos all jumbled up. We also got to see Zach Frazier a whole bunch as well. I thought he had a great day, but yeah, I mean, I think the, we talked to talk to Pat Meyer over the weekend. We kind of laid out the plan and he said, it's coming and here it is. Pat is a man of his word. You um kind of got my ears perked up there a little bit and this is just the fan in me island but mentioned mccormick getting more first team run and james daniels even sitting out a little bit maybe because of something that we've talked about yeah, i mean it's possible um i think that's something that i mean james daniels is a guy who's not going to practice that much right i mean he's it he doesn't certainly doesn't need it um i think that there's uh i i think there's it, if they traded James Daniels today, I think the starting lineup Friday for Houston would involve Nate Herbig at guard and Zach Frazier at center, probably. But I do think they yeah. consider Mason McCormick to be a player that they like and they want to get a look at. And so giving him first team reps is certainly reasonable in that regard. Gotcha. Okay. Um, you mentioned a whole bunch again, you know, this is just a day by day thing. I feel like the answers are kind of boring because what can you really take from it? But what would you say in terms of like the comfort level with, you know, Broderick on the left side, Troy on the right side? I think they look great. I, I think they look really, really good. I think Broderick had one of his best days. I thought Troy had one of his best days. It's really, um, they moved well. It was a good run period, man. The backs were, were getting holes. Um, especially like the second, you know, cause, cause those guys were working basically the first team and the second team all together. So they were working with a lot of the second team backs and like Jonathan wardens and Michael P Ryan had a field day. They were, they were just, they had holes everywhere. Uh, we saw screens with bodies flying and we saw pulling tackles and guards. And uh, I, I thought it was a really strong day from the entire offensive line, probably the best run blocking I've seen where like, we've talked a lot about, you know, the, the, the physicality. Um, but this was probably like the best technical run blocking I've seen in terms of like guys just getting moved. You know, there's a big difference between toughness and physicality and, and actual like technique and, and blocking. And I think they really, they've been physical, but I think today they really showed off their, their prowess in terms of uh, the run blocking and moving people. And there, there were some big holes out there. Um, and so it took some bravery. Like you saw some Steelers DBs in some uncomfortable situations. Guys like Dante Jackson and Corey Trice having to like, oh man, this is a big hole. And here's Najee freaking Harris in the middle of it. And I'm going to, I'm going to dive at his ankles and hope it all goes well. <laughs> you know, like there's, they, the, the, those, those are the kind of things that happen when you get big holes from your offensive line. And, and I, we saw a lot of that today. I thought Corey Trice, uh, as a sidebar has, has uh, looked really nice since he's mm. gotten back into team reps and seems to be trusting that knee, man. He was diving in the pile uh, just so uh, he, he looks pretty good out there. But yeah, I, I thought the offensive line, I don't know that the different arrangement is what caused that, but they certainly looked really good today. Well, that's great to hear. It's, I mean, even about Corey Trice as the sidebar that you threw in there, that's great to hear. I feel like 
a lot of this stuff has kind of gotten lost in the shuffle. Something else has kind of been dominating Steelers headlines over the last couple of days. So whether it's, you know, your conversation that you had with Pat Meyer about the offensive line and getting some clarity there, and then it happening, Broderick seen more time on the left, and now Corey Trice uh, looking better and better as he gets more reps and reps. Those things have kind of flown under the radar. Uh, so it's great to bring them to light on here. We actually got a question about Pat Meyer and the offensive line uh, from the YouTube that I'll just tie in right now because it relates. Uh, Rob says, big question I would like to have Meyer's answer answer is why hasn't Troy been given the chance on the left side with more since it's the position that he played his whole college career at uh how much more polished is he in pass protection than would you than Jones is slash was yeah so two two part of there Troy Fatana is much more polished than Jones was as a rookie um and, you know even by like the end of the season I think Fatana just has fewer mistakes than Jones had in pass protection throughout the season um I do think that Troy Fulton was a little bit undersized for an NFL offensive mm. tackle. Um, and when you look at the way that usually plays out in a negative fashion, it's from big, long edge rushers with bull rushes. You know, the, the, the guy that that lack of length will show up against is Bud Dupree, right? Just this mm. giant long freak who pushes you backwards. Uh, Miles Garrett, okay, another guy. Well, Miles Garrett's great beyond his bull rush, but certainly is someone that can do that to you. And I think more often than not, guys with that sort of ability are going to line up over the left tackle. Um, the team's best pass rushers, their most dangerous pass rushers, are going to line up over the left tackle more often than not. TJ doesn't, and, and not everyone does. But And so I think ideally for the Steelers, um, if you look at uh, – I looked up Troy Falton's RAS here. His height at six foot three and three quarters is a 0 0.89 out of 10 in terms of uh, height grade for an offensive tackle. So and that's that's short. Now, he does have longer arms compared to his height at 34 and a half inches, but I, I think – because of that, that's why a lot of people in the pre-draft process said maybe he could be a player that moves to guard. I certainly think the Steelers are probably a little bit more comfortable with him being a right tackle than a left tackle if that works mm -hmm. out. I, I not saying they wouldn't do it the other way, but I think that's why they're going to try this way first because I think just from a size matchup, that makes the most sense. What was, this, what was the second part there? Um shoot i clicked off of it to go to the other question that we were going to answer uh the only thing can, how much oh how much more polished is he than jones was oh yeah yeah i got that yeah he's 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 pretty pretty darn polished yeah, which we all, I mean, you know, when we had DB on here before the draft and I even thought so going back and watched him, I would have said, like, you know, more games obviously played. I just felt like his pass protection was so much further along um, than where Broderick was last year. Not to say Broderick can't get there, just, you know, in year one, I felt better about Fotanu as a pass protector. Um, yeah, Did you have any other, like, I know that you mentioned Corey Trice there, but other than the offensive line, other than Russ going first and seven shots, any other takeaways from today's practice? Um, before we get into another question that we have. Yeah, I thought that uh, the, D, the the safeties did a nice job coming up and playing the run. Um, Nate Metters had a good day. He had an interception. He looked strong against the run as well. Um, Ryan Watts, I think, continues to look really good. Uh, mm -hmm. Arrow way up on him, man. I, I, was, I was pretty skeptical on him being able to make this team while being a six-round pick, going through a position change. Like that's not easy to do. I, I think he's really killed it. Um, when do you I, do I, um, like? An, do you do an updated projection for the fifty-three man before we get like, to that point? Like one of the big benefits of being the editor of the site is that there's no one to tell me when I have to do things. <laughs> I probably should have done one already. Um, maybe we'll wait till after the first preseason game. How about that? That's fair. Yeah, I just didn't know how you felt about him now as it stands. I'd put him on the 53 right now. Yeah, okay. I would. Now I didn't go through and that I'm... say like I would have to go through and say who I would take off and I, you know, I don't know, yeah. but just gut feel, I think he's on. He's one of the guys like for for preseason football how many guys like for me it's more about watching individual players obviously like the the result of the game doesn't really matter. Ryan Watts is somebody that I'm very excited to watch on Friday. I think that's a good call. I think 
actually, I think there's a lot of like young, like Corey Trice. We talked about Beanie Bishop is obviously, I think everyone should be pretty yeah. excited about seeing. Um, so I, yeah, I think there's a lot of good young players on this team that are going to get actually, some run. Don't further answer that. That's something we can dive into later in the week. Players that we should be circling to watch in Friday. I like that as a topic. Ooh, so, ooh, okay. And we yeah. did get the news that the, um, the, the Texans are going starters. So you're going to get to see CJ Stroud. Talked to Corey Trice about this today, actually. Um, and man, uh, just like really cool catching up with Corey because just talking to him about being able to play in this game, he is so excited. <laughs> he is mm. just so excited about putting on the Steelers uniform for real and going out there in a game. He's been with the team for, I mean, a year and four months now. Uh, hasn't been able to do it. Had to go through rehab. Had to watch the whole rest of his rookie class do everything they did last year. I'm not yeah. sure there's a player in a Steelers uniform right now that is more excited about this preseason game than number 27. He is raring to go. Uh, I think you may see it's him awesome. as the starting dime DB and then probably also working as a second team outside corner on Friday. That's awesome. What about uh, on the defensive line? specifically from today or updates up until this point and that because a question that we have kind of will tie into that but i didn't know if specifically anything you've seen recently has kind of you know made you feel one way or another about that that roster decision that's coming up yeah uh we got a question about this too didn't we um yeah. uh, demarvin leal has been really good all through camp now he got banged up today i don't know the extent of the injury we'll we'll see where that goes uh, but mm -hmm. Leal's been getting a ton of reps, man. He's been going through the line twice, basically. He's been working as a second-team mm -hmm. defensive lineman. And then because they're so short of edge rushers, he's been going back out with the third-team edge rushers. And mm -hmm. I, the 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 person that there's – no one is excited about injuries, but I'll tell you this. The third-team offensive line is very happy to not have to deal with the Marvin Leal anymore because he has been wrecking them when he goes in there uh, with that third team as an outside linebacker. He's just blown up so many plays. Uh, he's looked really good. I think Isaiah Loudermilk has had a very strong camp as well. You know, he's a different kind of player. He's not as flashy. He's not the kind of guy that shows up all the time, but he's made some big hits in seven shots in the goal line, drove Nashi Harris back from the goal line yesterday, like solid collision in the hole and, and drove him back. That That's that's a tough job, uh, and I think Loudermilk's been pretty good. I would say those two guys are way ahead in terms of the depth defensive line battle. I mean, obviously, you know, Cam, Larry, Keanu Benton, Mon Adams, those guys are on the team. I think I would, you know, Dean Lowry hasn't practiced yet. He's got a he's got a contract. I, you know, I don't I don't yeah. think they're gonna try to cut him, but like uh if I was Dean Lowry, I would I would want to get back soon because I think I think ninety two and ninety eight are making some hay. And then I don't think Logan Lee's been bad, but it's been a clear step down from those other two guys. And and I would put Braden Fajoko in between them. I I'm just very cautious about hyping up Braden Fajoko again because I thought he looked so good last year, yeah. and then they never gave him a chance. So I but he is very good, um, and I think he's probably been better than Lee right now. I think I'd probably have them both though off the 53. I think I would go with assuming that Lowry gets back to health, Hayward, Benton, Ogunjobi. Loudermilk, Leal, Adams, and then Lowry as as the seventh. So both Leal and Loudermilk making it. Because that's what Varzak said. Uh, I'm curious as to whether or not you think Loudermilk is doing enough to keep his job. Would have thought he and Leal were running out of chances and that one of them was going to be gone, kind of competing for just one spot. Yeah, I mean, I think I think they're both been better than Lee, and I think that's probably the battle there was two spots for those three guys, and now maybe with Lowry's injury, that opens the door for Lee or for Hoko or somebody to to come in and and try to steal one. But I, I think Lee Allen and Loudermilk are close to roster locks right now, unless somebody wants his... to trade. Unless somebody wants to trade for one of them, you know, yeah. it is a position of pretty significant depth. Not saying that. 49ers need defensive line help or anything. Hey, there you go. There you, I was just going to say, I was just saying it as a joke, but there you go. Um, the other part of what he brought up though, that we didn't, I just want to ask about, cause he also said, he just made a comment. Good to hear about Zach Frazier. I do feel like just, you know, as a fan going through, scrolling through on Twitter each day uh, in, li in live time as practice is going on, I have seen Zach Frazier's name a bit more than I was early in camp. And it seems like, well, what do you know? It's a rookie that seems to be getting better as time goes on. 
yeah, I think Frazier looked pretty good this week. Uh, you're starting to see those highlights really pop, man. He's He's been plowing into people. When he gets pulling, when he gets out on screens, he's really, really, like, just violent. Um, is that the separator, do you think, between him and Herbie? Is his ability and speed? His like, athleticism. As a yes, yeah. yes. Reaching to the second level, pulling. Like, Herbie is, is big and tough and strong, but he's not fast. And Zach Frazier moves for an offensive lineman. And I think that is probably the upside potential that that, that provides is, is pretty significant. But Herbig's been really good. I, I don't think Nate Herbig has done anything to lose his job. You know, I, he's not making mistakes. He looks strong out there. Good snaps. It's not getting pushed back into the quarterback. Like, I, I, I think he's had a really good camp. But I do think you're starting to see the light come on a little bit for Zach Frazier these last couple of days in a significant way. He's still having some, like, some sloppier reps. I will say he's more up and down than, say, Fuatanu, who I think has just been very steady. Uh, if not like spectacular, I think Frazier has had like some more highs, but some more lows, you know, where he, he's got some pancake blocks. He's also got some, some, some gaffes. And so uh, if he can clean up, if he can keep cleaning it up and, and keep making some of those highlight blocks, I, I mean, look, still should be very excited about the long-term future of Zach Frazier, whether that results in a week one start this year or not. It kind of got my mind going though, right there by saying like, to no fault of his own, Nate, Nate Herbig could have a fantastic camp. But ultimately, if they see the way that Zach Frazier's athleticism could translate in this offense and they feel like we need that from this position, like it's possible that Nate Herbig, not necessarily, it wouldn't be him losing his job. It would just be Zach Frazier winning it. Yeah, and I, I think I do think that Frazier is a better fit for this offensive scheme with his athleticism, the way they want to reach to the second level on those wide zone blocks. Like that's that's athletically demanding. The number of screens they've run, man, let me tell you, uh, it's it's significant. So I mean, that's the, it's all athleticism. So I do think that Frazier's skill set is probably a better fit for the scheme than than Herbig's is. Okay. All right. Um... Was there anything else that I guess we should talk about uh, get an update on the receivers as well? That's been a position that we've talked about, obviously, a lot uh, as Steelers fans for one that's not currently on the roster, but the ones that are on the roster, what have we seen as of late? Pretty quiet day today. Again, mostly run period. Two two practices in a row where it was mostly mm -hmm. run. Uh, Quez Watkins had a couple drops today in a team period. I wrote my winners and losers from the second week of training camp uh, on the site on Monday, and I included him as a loser. I, you know, this was a pretty wide open wide receiver room. We talked about it before training camp where there was four or five guys that you could sort of realistically see emerging as somebody's favorite target, you know, like that, that easily could have happened. And Quez yeah. Watkins has as much experience as any of those guys. He has not really separated himself in a positive way. I think Scotty Miller has been better. Um, and so uh, I, I think that, that that's probably the one like takeaway from today where he had a couple drops uh, that you, it, you don't want to see. Um, and so I'd say that's, that's been the one thing there. Uh, Scotty Miller actually continues to look good and Roman Wilson walking around, not in his boot, just a little wrap on his well, ankle. I was going to bring up Roman about the Quez thing, just because like there wasn't a, you know, in my opinion, an easier wide receiver room to crack, to earn a job. Like the opportunity was there for everybody. Obviously you knew Jewish pick was going to be at the top, but for everybody else that was on this roster, the opportunity was there for the taking. And then Roman Wilson gets hurt and like still, you know, an NFL veteran and Quez Watkins, who's kind of been there and done that, not seizing the opportunity, pretty disappointing, but um, you know, and they already released Marquez Calloway. So who, who knows, but you're saying Scotty Miller has kind of been the guy, if you had to pick somebody that's kind of one within that group over the last few days. Yeah. And Des Fitzpatrick has been very steady. You know, I think he's a good player, not a great player, but he is a good player and he's someone that they could lean on if they need to, if, if Roman's you know still injured come the start of the regular season or something like that. Gotcha. Any other, t Oh, I feel like we haven't talked about, uh, you mentioned it was a heavy run period in the running backs. Do you still feel like, cause still no, oh, no, no, I Sorry, I do have something else I want to add. Okay. Uh, we had a question a couple weeks ago or a couple days ago about uh, situational football, and today we mm. did get a lot of situational football. Play clock okay. at practice. Uh, they did live transitions. So usually in between periods, the whistle blow or the horn blows, and then everyone goes and gets a drink of water and kind of you know mulls around for a second, and then we get going with the next thing. But today, like as soon as the team period ended. 
the team period ended with the last offensive play, and then the field goal unit ran onto the field like they would if it was a normal fourth down with that play clock ticking on Chris Boswell and Christian Kuntz and, and Cameron Johnson to get the whole operation lined up. And so that was the first time we got some of that stuff. Mike Tomlin said, look, we're going to be in a stadium this Friday. It's on us to not, like, screw it up. Like, we got to be ready for this kind of stuff. So, like, they painted the sideline boxes on the sideline. So they want guys used to standing where they're going to stand for the game. Coach has got to find a guy to get them ready to go into the game you know, doing like live instead of like the whole second team offense kind of standing behind the unit in like a huddle, they're on the sideline they're making actual like player swaps into and out of the lineup like you would in a normal game to just sort of get the touch and feel for uh, that process. And uh, they did end. This is the second time we've done it now, but with a two minute drill, uh, but it was just the second team, which is interesting. Kyle Allen out there. It did not go very well. They, uh, they were stuffed on a fourth down. There was those two Quez Watkins drops right in a row, and then Jare Jenkins had one go right off his face mask. That was fourth mm -hmm. down. Mike Tomlin threw like a bogus penalty to keep him going, and they got stuffed eventually again anyway. So a uh, solid win for the defense today. They also won four, three, and seven shots. So I'll call that two straight practice Ws for the, the gold shirts. But uh, – yeah, I, I think it was a pretty solid day today overall, and yeah, did did get some of that because we had just it was not too long ago we had a question about that. Yeah, yeah, I remember that on the on YouTube. But uh, the last thing that I wanted to bring up real quick was just the running backs, um, just because Quarter they're not really participating, and as a vet, like he doesn't really have to. He's also somebody that out of this group was familiar with the offense and Arthur Smith. I just didn't know if there was a guy like a you know a Jonathan Ward, an Aaron Champlin that you felt like maybe was making. I feel like it's been kind of quiet. Like are any of those guys you feel like making a push at all uh, for what they could bring in a special teams capacity or whatever to actually make this roster. I think they're all making a push, man. I think they've all been very good. Uh, the mm. first three, anyway. Dejan Edwards, I think, is, is clearly yeah. after the first three guys, and he fumbled today. Cam Sutton knocked it out. Mm. Um, not not what you want to see there. Um, but I think Jonathan Ward has been really good. I think Aaron Shanklin has been really good. I think Michael P. Ryan has been really good. Just from a physical standpoint, I think Ward has the most impressive traits. He's got the most burst, the most athleticism. Uh, he's a really good pass protector. I think he's probably a little bit ahead in that regard. He's also had some more mistakes than the other guys, a couple drops, you know, and like mm. some of that stuff. Um, so like, I'd say he's a little bit more up and down. He's also was one of the kickoff returners, which is a really good sign for him. Uh, you know, that he was in that mix where I think he was the second team kickoff returner, him and Quez Watkins when they did kickoff return for the first time. So uh, I, I think he's probably if, if if you made me pick a guy there, it'd be him. I'm not sure that any of them are going to make the roster. I think they're probably going to keep yeah. just the three, and that's a training camp job for someone like Jonathan Ward. But I, I I think he's earned a job, that's for sure. For a guy who was here at rookie camp on a tryout, he's looked pretty darn good. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's that's great to hear. Uh, I think that's it. Unless you got anything else. No, I don't think that's it. There we go. Uh, Alan, tell the people where they can find you. At uh, You can find me at Dino's in Latrobe tonight. I will be on the go. DVE morning show camp special at 8 p.m. So you can check that out. Uh, also, at on X, Instagram, and TikTok at Saunders underscore PGH. Site's account is PGH Steelers. Now go to SteelersNow.com, read the words so I can get paid. All kinds of great stuff from training camp there. Don't miss it. And uh, we'll be back here tomorrow with another Steelers morning rush. Steelers practice report, Steelers afternoon drive, sights and sounds, interviews, all the great stuff on the YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, hit that bell for notifications. There we go. If you are not on YouTube, for whatever reason, if you're listening to the podcast somewhere else, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from, be sure to leave us a five-star review over there. Subscribe. Just search Steelers afternoon drive. We will pop up. Alan already said everything else. YouTube, TikTok, you got those boxes checked. Find me everywhere, Zachary Smith, PGH, Valen Saunders, and myself. Thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers afternoon drive. Yeah.